Welcome back, everybody, to the full story and lore of Wizard 101 Explained. Not going to waste any time. We're going to jump right back into it. Just want to say before we start, thank you for watching. I hope you all enjoy. So I mentioned in part one that I would discuss Grozenheim in the official Arc 2 video because I figured it would fit better there. But I decided to give Grozenheim its own video for reasons I'll explain at the very end. But for now, let's just jump right into it. Grozenheim is a world that is inspired by Norse mythology, very airy and cold landscape with snowy mountains, glacial ridges, and large trees, etc. Grozenheim is home to three tribes, the bears, the wolves, and the ravens. All three of these tribes live and thrive by different codes and beliefs. The bears are explained as makers of fine things and are all about honor and strength. This makes sense since as later on we'll see that the bears are the ones who are merchants and craftsmen and the people that we would later go on to establish trade agreements with the wolves are all about speed and cunning and are seen as swift hunters and night runners the ravens they love their magic they're seen as crafty sages and honeyed speakers according to the book tooth claw and wing magic and counsel is the raven's way the book also states however that all three of these tribes must dwell in peace and govern themselves accordingly no matter what as we would later find out this definitely did not happen through the other history books scattered around grizzleheim we then learn about the story of yorl and and also the story of the Grindles. From what I gather from the story of Yorl, it seems to establish a type of hierarchy. The story reads, from the Darkling Woods came the sage king Rhaegar, wealthy in lore and runecraft. The young warrior Yorl learned the runes from Rhaegar, the truth they told, Rhaegar's counsel served Yorl wise. In times to come, Yorl was named his son and his king. Thane and Thrall were Yorl's two brothers, master and servant were their roles. If you played Skyrim at all, this would sound familiar. You have the king and then the Yorl are right under that. Then it seems that under the Yorl is the Thane and then the Thrall is like on the bottom. The story of the Grendels goes like this. First mother of the Grendels sought safety for her child. To all things she sought an oath against harm. To soothe a worried mother all oaths but one were sworn. It was not the spider queen's nature to keep a promise. To love untested and unthreatened is to live without humility. Monsters and evil grew the Grendel kin. Old oaths forgotten are still potent wards against harm. The first among the Grendels hold little in fear. A nuisance are the youngest of that wretched kind. A calamity are the eldest and strongest. If you guys don't know this is a reference to the poem known as Beowulf as a it contains the story of the Grendel and his mother. The rest of the books in Grizzleheim talk about the rune stones and the runic text. Runes are obviously very important to Grizzleheim's lore. The runes are said to contain information regarding skill and power and something that people can consult for knowledge. According to the book, The Test of Runes, a person must know how to carve runes, how to read them, how to paint them, how to prove them, how to cast the runes, and how to find them. You need to know all of these things to become a rune master. Some rune translations throughout Grizzleheim and Winter Tusk include the large stones in Northgard that read Big Bear Fort. In the Davalier near Grumlick, the runes read Lo, there do I see the line of my people calling to me. It bid me to take my place among among them in the halls of Valhalla. By the way, it does say among twice. There the brave shall forever rest in time. I'm actually curious as to whose point of view the runic text is like speaking from. If anybody has an idea, please comment down below. And then a little fun one is that in Wintertusk, there's a sign with runes which translated reads the names Rick Tammy, Dol Greg, Jeff Kyle, Tim Amy, Sarah Trent, Lucy Vlad, and Kate Kim. For those of you who don't know, these are the names of the artists and the people who worked on Winter Tusk when it was first coming out. So pretty cool Easter egg, actually. With that being said, we will now get into the story of Grizzleheim and why we go there in the first place. A bear by the name of Baldur Goldpaws wants to establish trade relations with Wizard City and the world that he's from known as Grizzleheim, as he feels as though Grizzleheim would greatly benefit from being involved with the merchants of Wizard City. He first requires us to speak with Prospector Zeke, our treasure card dealer, and anyone in Wizard City who deals with furniture to see if they'd be willing to be involved with trading with Grizzleheim. They all, of course, happily agreed to be involved as it would be great for business on both ends. Baldur Goldpaws then offers us to accompany him on a quick trip back to his world of Grizzleheim and ask the merchants there if they'd want to be involved with the trade from Wizard City. They, of course, naturally all agree as it would be great for business on their end as well. After this, Baldur Goldpaws takes us back to Wizard City and we continue questing on in the normal storyline. Now, canonically, these events do take place in the early parts of Arc 1, so when we get back home, we immediately resume trying to solve the whole Malastar debacle. Later on in our journey, however, Headmaster Ambrose contacts us with a distress signal. He explains that at one point, the Grizzleheim World Tree was once linked to the rest of the spiral, but the contact was eventually lost and was assumed to be flat out destroyed. However, Bartleby had just informed him that the portal to Grizzleheim is now active and traveling there is now possible through the World Tree. He wants us to go and make allies with the warriors there and speak to their king. When we arrive there, a bear by the name of Bjorn 
Lorn Ironclaws, who was standing guard by the king's quarters, informs us that we are not allowed to see the king. Because of recent events, none of them trust any outsiders, so in order for us to speak to the king, we need to prove that we are worthy enough and gain the trust of the bears. Bjorn then sends us to Saverstead Pass to speak to his sword brother, Hagen Shieldbreaker. Hagen first wants to know if we are cowardly or courageous, so he tasks us with defeating some troubled warriors first. After proving to be courageous in battle, we then need to build a reputation for ourselves. Now, because Brusselheim is a very patriarchal society, there is a lot of emphasis on father and descendants, meaning that a big part of someone's reputation in the society will be heavily based on what their father accomplished. So our next step is that we need to convince a great hero to speak highly of us as if we were his own child. We confront a warrior named Ingvar Sharptooth, and after defeating him in battle, we are given his blessing. Following this, we go on to defeat some split hoof barbarians in order to keep building and maintaining our reputation amongst the people of Grizzleheim. After this, Hagen informs us that Bjorn was supposed to send a blacksmith by the name of Irnor Thunderhammer to the camp to tend to the weapons and armor. He never showed up though, so it's assumed that he was captured by the split hoof barbarians. We end up freeing him from their captivity, and this not only helps the bearers, but also helps our reputation even more. Our last task here is to fight the Grendels, as Hagen explains that if we are to become one of the bearers, their enemies become our enemies as well. The bearers have been fighting against the Grendels for years, and he wants us to take back an old fort named Draugart that was invaded by Grendels. Also, naturally, for us to eventually get the opportunity to speak with the king, the best way to go about that is to, of course, fight the Grendels, which is their main enemy. We speak to Soren the Wise, who is now a deceased blacksmith who used to create powerful weapons to combat the Grendels some time ago. That unfortunately weren't enough as he was killed in combat. However, he teaches us how to make a blade using the venom of spiders that would defeat the Grendels once and for all. We head back to talk to the blacksmith and he explains that we first need to gather his tools that were taken from him by the split hooves when he was captured. Specifically, an individual named Bloodseeker currently has them. After defeating him, we return Irnar's tools and we can now begin forging the blade. Irnar says that the blade would be forged according to their ancient traditions as well as implementing the new technique we learned from Soren the Wise. We need to collect three items, peat, spider icor, and the stinger of the spider queen known as Scathy, the strongest of the spiders in Webwood. Peat, according to Irnar, is a sort of rotten mud they use to make bog iron. The way you use it is that you can burn it down to get the bits of iron out of it. Then the spider icor is going to be used to make the blade and the queen stinger is going to be crafted within the blade as well. After bringing these items to the blacksmith, he forges the blade for us. The last thing we need is for the blade to be blessed by spirits, as the spirits will give the blade great power. Actually, it needs to be blessed three times. We summon an old forest spirit named Iron Splitter by the board camp. Then we evoke the water spirit named Whisper Stu- what the fuck? Then we evoke the water spirit named Whisper Tide by the waterfall, and finally we summon the fire spirit known as Storm Glare in front of the campfire. After we receive their blessings on the sword, we head to Draugarth and we first smack down some lesser grundles to make our presence known. Then we head inside the fortress, defeat Skellic, and reclaim the fort once and for all. We head back to Hagen to give the news and are given his recommendation. Back in Northgar, we speak with Bjorn once again, and he tasks us with heading into Vigrid Ruffland and speaking with Ejil Axeberger, who was guardian of Anders Holt. He explains that an individual named Ivar Anderson, their Thane, which as mentioned earlier, the Thane is the ones that are under the Ural and are supposed to be their leader, betrayed his village to a group of warriors known as the Red Claw. Ivar opened their gates to the Red Claw clan and they raided the village, driving Ejil and his men out. This caused the people of Anders Holt to become hungry, cold, and afraid. And Ejil isn't able to go and hunt for them because he needs to stay and defend them here by the campsite. So we first need to offer aid by heading into the forest and gathering some fur from the ferocious wild claws, as well as some winter berries for food. After returning, Ejil informs us that three others of his village are still lost in the wild and would be harmed if caught by the Red Claw. After locating where they're hiding, we lead them back to where the rest of the village is. Actually, all three of them tell us they will find their own way back to the campsite. But anyway, now it's time for some defenses as the Red Claw informers are slowly getting closer to the village camp, and we must defeat some before they get too close. This turns out to be a power move, as if the Red Claw doesn't hear back from their informers, they will either think that the people of Andrus Holt are dead, or they will be too afraid to attack any further due to the lack of information. Either way, this puts them in a pretty good spot. Ejil then tells us that another one of their villagers are missing, a wise bear named Grimnir. Grimnir will actually actually later go on to be one of the keys to figuring out what happened with Ivar and why he betrayed his people. We go speak to him and he tells us that he's known Ivar since he was a child and he would never willingly betray his people. As a matter of fact, his grandfather was the one who founded Andrus Holt to begin with. He instead suspects that Ivar is under the control of some dark enchantment because that's how loyal he is to his people. After informing Idril about this, he says that he honestly doesn't know anything about enchantment and wouldn't be much help in that regard. However, he does tell us that there's an old Grendel wizard named Bolthorn who lives in the boy 
Boiling Fields, who happens to know a lot about dark magic. We go console him to see if there may be a remedy to cure Ivar. Bolthorn agrees to assist us with a cure, but not without a price. He wants the claw of a brave warrior, specifically one who guards the weak. And, you know, obviously, who who else does that sound like to you guys? After hearing this, Ajil is a little taken aback at first, and, you know, rightfully so, but he is willing to give him one of his claws. Ajil gives us one of his smaller claws, and we take it back to Bolthorn. After collecting a few more items after this, Bolthorn makes a salve for us that will allow us to enter the Vigrid Ruffling Crypt. According to Bolthorn, we need to head inside and retrieve a sacred talisman called the Eye of Truth. This item will apparently give us what we need to cure Ivar Anderson if he is under the control of some type of enchantment. After battling our way through the crypt and defeating the spirit Lothan Doombringer, which is a fire name, I just had to mention it, we collect the Eye of Truth. We now need to head into Frostholm in order to free Ivar, but we first need to go back and speak with Grimnir for more insight before we head in. He explains that the best course of action is to sneak in and cause trouble for them from the inside. The Red Claw have been looting the village and all nearby lands of all weapons so they can arm themselves as much as possible and keep everyone else from fighting back. Meaning that if we show up to the gates with a really powerful weapon, they will assume that we're actually with the Red Claw ourselves and will let us in. The leader of the Red Claw and Anders Holt, Ragnar Stormbrow, carries the finest weapon Grimnir had ever seen. So we must take it from him so we can gain access to Frostholm, which another cool ass name by the way. I'm just gonna say this now, for every cool name that is in the remainder of this story, I'm just gonna mention how cool it is because a lot of these boss names are amazing. After defeating Ragnar, we collect the weapon and are allowed inside. Luckily, inside, there's a bear named Ulrich Oathbreaker who's playing a double agent right now. Oathbreaker obviously makes a lot of sense now. Ulrich actually claims that Grimnir informed him about us and how he already knows we're trying to drive out the Red Claw and is willing to help us. While I am glad that he's willing to help us, I don't get how he was able to know that we were here before we actually got to Frost Home. If Grimnir couldn't even get past the gates to get inside, how were they able to communicate with each other? Okay. Anyway, Ulrich pretended to break his oath with his people in order to learn how to defeat the Red Claw from the inside, but he is still loyal to the village of Anders Holt. According to Ulrich, we first need to gain the trust of the Red Claw camp leader, Gunnar Quickaxe. However, we're gonna play a little game. Every time he gives us a task, we're gonna do the exact opposite. Basically killing two birds in one stone. If we go off and sabotage the things that Gunnar asks us to do, because he's not actively watching us do these things, if we sabotage them, in the process, not only do we gain his trust and get closer to saving Ivar because he just assumes that we're doing these tasks, correctly, we're able to simultaneously weaken the Red Claw by sabotaging them from the inside without their camp leader knowing anything. We start by defeating Haldor Stormwatcher and sabotaging the weapons he's got stored, which will weaken the Red Claw when they try to use them in combat. Next, we have to give Scar Snout, the leader of the boars, blueberry juice, which makes him angry as he thinks we're comparing the boars to the bears. This will make sure that the Red Claw don't have the boars as allies as well. And then instead of interrogating the villagers like Gunnar asks, we're instead going to free them. However, after Strike 3, eventually Gunnar does find out that we're causing trouble and attempts to attack us. We're able to best him in combat, however, and we can now head inside the fortress and confront Ivar. After taking him down, we use the Eye of Truth on Ivar, and it is revealed that he was actually an imposter. And this entire time, he was actually a raven by the name of Mord Rune Chanter. This raven had been impersonating him this whole time. As it turns out, Ivar never betrayed his village. After revealing his true identity, Mord exclaims that they have the Thane and you cannot stop us, meaning that he's not working alone, which then immediately begs the question, where is Ivar Anderson then? We break the news to Ajil and he tells us to immediately inform Bjorn as to what happened here. Bjorn informs us that the wolves are now angry at the king because they have proof that the bears have sided with the Red Claw. The wolves claim that they captured the real Ivar Anderson, and because we discovered that the individual in Frost Home was an imposter, that means this has to be the real deal. Because of this, the bears and the wolves are gearing up to go to war against each other, as the bears wish to rescue the true Ivar Anderson once and for all from their midst. So we need to demonstrate our loyalty to the king by aiding the warriors getting ready for the assault in Merkholm Keep. When we get there, you immediately notice that there's multiple catapults launching large boulders into enemy territory, meaning that the war has already started. We go and speak with Osric Grimbold and he tells us that we need to first defeat a Moonstrider scout in order to slow them down so that the bears can ready their own attack. After this, the next step is to retrieve more boulders for the catapults that were taken by the Canyon Raiders. After defeating a few, we're able to retrieve the boulders and move on to the next phase. The bears assault is almost ready, but we still need to prepare a few more things. Because as a wizard, we don't look anything like the bears, our presence won't alert them when we show up. So Osric's next plan is to go and challenge some of the wolves in combat to test their skill to see what we're really up against. Also inspect the Wolf Fortress Gate and see how sturdy it really is. After taking down some Moonstrider Howlers, we go and inspect the Fortress Gate and as expected, it's heavily fortified and could probably withstand any assault, so we need to change plans. An individual named Wolfric Foesbane has sided with the bears in this conflict and could potentially be the key to beating the wolves in this war, so we need to go speak with him. Fortunately, he's 
literally right next to us in the camp. But anyway, Wolfric Foesbane drops some very heavy information. First, he clarifies that he still stands with the wolves. However, he strongly believes that the wolves are being lied to. And because of this, he's unwelcome there. But he truly does not believe that the bears are allies of the Red Claw. He also goes on to tell us that a raven named Moon and Mistweaver came to them with a captive. The captive, of course, being Ivar Anderson. Moonen claimed that Ivar Anderson was actually leading the Red Claw against the wolves and then simultaneously offered him as prisoner to the wolves. However, according to Wolfric, he says it's foolish to trust a raven, so he immediately didn't believe him. He then suggests to go speak with their leader, Ingolf Moonheart, to figure out the next step. After helping Ingolf heal some of the wounded wolves, we go and speak with Wolfric again. His next plan is for us to go up against and defeat the strongest of wolf warriors, Heglak Shadowstalker and Otto Winter Watcher. Defeating them will cause the other wolves to become uncertain and their courage will break. We take them down to head inside the caves to help some lost warriors of the wolves return to camp. After this, we need to defeat a wolf named Scarl Doomhowler, again, another cool name, who holds the key to the armory. After defeating him, we gather the weapons from the armory, leaving them with nothing. Now it's time to focus our attention on Moonin. There's a Grendel shaman by the name of Kirk here who knows how to make a certain magic dust that when thrown into the air causes everyone in the vicinity to only speak the truth. If we can collect this dust, we can use it on Moonin and reveal him as a betrayer. His lies will be revealed and this could potentially put an end to the war. Wolfric does warn us though that Hercure is not to be trusted and is known to break promises if it benefits him. After a series of events of basically doing chores for this dude and him attempting to betray us, we end up having to defeat him in battle, but at the end, Hercure does give us what we need. Now it's time to enter the main chamber in the cave and confront Moonin and hopefully find Ivar Anderson. We grab a few torches and set some things on fire as a distraction, defeat the wolves guarding the two levers on the left and the right of the chamber, and head inside. When we get inside the chamber, a lot of things are immediately alarming. First, we do see the real Ivar Anderson trapped inside a cage as prisoner. Then right next to him, we see Wolfric Foesbane, the one that's been basically helping us this whole time. On top of that, Moonin is in the process of keeping up the lie that the bears are in league with the Red Claw, and that we ourselves are a spy to destroy all of them. We immediately engage in combat with Moonin and are able to defeat him. While he's stunned after the fight, we throw the dust into the air that we got from Hercure, and it forces Moonin to only tell the truth, and reveals the truth he does. He admits that the bears are innocent and are not allies of the Red Claw. One of the ravens took Ivar's shape and betrayed his people to the Red Claw and then brought Ivar here in order to anger the bears. This was so that the bears would not only be at war against the Red Claw, but also be at war with the wolves. As he's about to continue, he stops talking right before he reveals the raven's ultimate goal. We immediately go and report this information to Bjorn Ironclaws back in Northgard. Because of all that we've done, Done so far, rescuing the Thane and ending the war between the wolves and the bears, and discovering that the ravens are responsible, we are now very much worthy enough to speak to the king, as our likeness is now in the league with other historic heroes of Grezelheim, even eclipsing that of the Yarn Iron Claws. We finally get to speak with the king, Valgard Goldenblade, who is accompanied by a Varric Ice Fang, who we saw earlier in Mirkholm Keep, and a raven named Cole Shadowsong. The king informs us that an old enemy threatens their land, a massive grundle named Jotun. He has requested a challenge to face us in combat. Because of our actions in Saverstad Pass, in regards to the Grendel, Joden of course heard about it and wants his revenge. To make it even worse, he has two brothers that also want a piece of the action. Joden and his brothers all dwell in the Undercity known as Nadavalir, just outside of Northgard. It seems we made him angry and we need to deal with him. When we get to Nadavalir before entering the Hall of Valor, a couple things are interesting in the area. There are these huge paintings on the walls that depict the battle between the Fire and the Ice Titan, which are really first of all awesome but this also means that the ice titan definitely is involved with grizzleheim in some way anyway we head inside to confront jotun and after a long and very difficult battle we're able to take him down along with his two brothers we head back to northgard to speak with the king and because of our victory alongside all the things we've done so far he gives us the title of the greatest hero that he's ever met after this he goes on to say that both the wolves and the ravens are making claims that can't be believed on both ends so we need to head to ravenscar and speak to one of the ravens that the king trusts named raffin lore speaker however after he says this the raven standing next to him, Cole Shadowsong, reveals he himself is also a traitor and, and says that our doom is inevitable and leaves. It is perfectly clear now that the ravens are the ones responsible for putting wolf and bear against each other. It's obvious they wanted them to fight in order to keep them distracted from what's really going on behind the scenes. Now what their ultimate goal is, is still unknown. We then head to Ravenscar to speak with Raffin Lord Speaker, who according to him is in fact a trusted friend of the king. He explains that the events that have transpired in Grizzleheim so far are the result of a group of evil ravens known as the Coven. Our main goal now is to figure out what they're planning. A scout by the name of Skull and Icebrand claimed to have learned a few things about what the Coven are planning. However, unfortunately, he was captured and placed inside the Raven prison, so we need to rescue him and figure out what it is that he discovered. After obtaining the key to a cell and freeing him, he explains what happened. Apparently, he discovered an old scroll while exploring the glacial 
waste. He didn't know how to read it, so he gave it to one of the members of the coven. That coven member then read the scroll, but then became angry at Skullin. After reading it, he then summoned his brothers in the coven, and they brought Skullin into the prison and told him to keep quiet about the scroll. When the coven left, they said they were taking the scroll to the Tower of Lore to keep it safe and secret. For now, that's all he knows. We take this information back to Raph, and he informs us that in order to get into the Tower of Lore, we first need something called a spirit totem. After collecting a few items, Raffin is able to craft it for us, and we enter the tower, defeating Stragol, Gallo Grief, and are able to access the scroll. Raffin then joins us afterwards and reads the scroll for us, as we obviously can't read it because it's in runic text. He explains that the scroll tells of the great and terrible Everwinter, the cold season that will mark the end of the world. The scroll also explains the link between the rune stones that grant all magic power in this world. The wolves, bears, and ravens each control one. The rune stones are said to all be connected, and if one is able to capture their magic, they can control all the magic in Grozahan, which is what the ravens are trying to accomplish. The coven's plan is clear. They're trying to bring about the Everwinter and will trap this world in ice, thus destroying Grizzleheim completely. After collecting a mystic talent that will protect us from the raven's dark magic, we go and confront an old foe, the one who was impersonating Ivar Anderson earlier, Mord Rune Chanter. Our goal is to defeat him and figure out the rest of the names of the members of the coven. While he does pose a significant challenge, we're able to defeat him and access his trunk. Luckily, inside is a scrap of paper with some runic writing on it. This part is a little weird because we weren't able to read runic text before, but now we can. But anyway, the paper has two names on it, Moon and Mistweaver and Cole Shadow Song. We are now certain that Moon and Cole are both members of the Coven as well. Now that we know this information for sure, it's time for us to go on the offense. We confront Moon and battle him once again. However, after defeating him, unfortunately, there's nothing of value in his trunk. So next, we confront Cole Shadow Song. Fortunately for us, he left the skull containing the Coven's plans in his trunk. We take the scroll back to Raffin, and he informs us that in order for the Coven to complete the ritual to bring the Everwinter, they need two important artifacts, the Dwelling Chalice and the Heart of Winter. The Dwelling Chalice lies in the tower in the middle of Ravenscar, and the Heart of Winter lies in the Glacial Plains. After defeating the individuals guarding both items, we were able to obtain them both. However, upon returning to Raffin, he tells us that somehow the Coven were able to begin the ritual without the Dwelling Chalice or the Heart of Winter. The Coven is currently in the main fortress, so we need to head there immediately. Unfortunately, though, when we get there, we realize that the fortress is surrounded by a mystic barrier. This is puzzling because even with room magic, there's no way that the Coven can be performing the ritual while simultaneously keeping a mystic barrier up around the fortress, meaning that the barrier has to be kept up by an outside source nearby the fortress. We go and search through the nearby caves, and as it turns out, we discover that a Gertok barrier demon is what's responsible for the barrier being kept up. We speak with the demon, and he says that he means us no harm. He was in fact summoned here and bound by the coven, and as a result, he has no choice but to maintain the mystic barrier around the fortress. He then goes on to say that if we free him, he will leave this world immediately, and the mystic barrier will be undone. After gathering a few items, we follow his instructions in freeing the demon. However, after this, he betrays us and faces us in combat. The demon is unsuccessful and we are able to defeat him, thus destroying the barrier around the main fortress. We are now able to head inside and confront the coven once and for all. When we enter the main fortress, we notice that one more raven that we have not yet seen is upon them. He boasts that the ritual to bring the Everwinter is almost complete. We enter battle and confront all four coven members as it's now all or nothing. And after a long and vicious fight, the coven is taken down and they plan to bring the Everwinter upon Grizzleheim is thwarted. We return to Northgard and speak with the king, and through our actions here, we become Grizzleheim's greatest hero, and an example of what an outsider can accomplish here. So now canonically because they decreased the cap for winter tusk and you can actually do it at like literally level 20 if you wanted to assumingly and maybe i'm just a weirdo but i just end up doing winter tusk right after this because i like xp story wise a bit of time passes between the events of grozaheim and winter tusk so we'll just go off of that we receive a message from merle ambrose that grozaheim is yet again in danger so we head back to visit an old friend bjorn iron claws he explains that the coven are back and they won a round two but this time it isn't just grozaheim that's in jeopardy if the coven are able to play grozaheim with the everwinter it will spread across the entire higher spiral. We go and greet the king once more about this matter who then tells us to go and speak with Raffin, the one who was a key piece in taking down the coven the first time. According to Raffin, if you guys remember my part 1 video, in the Wizard 101 universe exists the Storm, Ice, and Fire Titan. The Ice Titan actually resides deep beneath Grozelheim as he was sent there by Bartleby himself and was put into a centuries long slumber. The coven's actions would cause the Ice Titan to awaken once again and would be more powerful than ever before. The coven is currently at work in a place called Hrundlefjord, a shipping port in the part of Grizzleheim called Winter Tusk, so that's our next stop. We consult with Baldur Goldpaws, and he takes us on his ship to Hrundlefjord. After gathering some information from the Frostbones, we use something that the folks of Grizzleheim call Norse Code 
in order to get past the town gates. I like that. That's pretty clever. Once we get through the gates, we need to speak to the Thane of Hrundlefjord named Veneer Stormroarer so we can figure out what's going on. There's a big issue present though. All the bears within the town walls are frozen in ice, assumingly frozen by the coven. Bother Goldpaws informs us about a crow named Morn Shadowbrew who could potentially help us in freeing them. After defeating her in battle, she tells us that geyser water is the key and even gives us an urn to use. We're able to unfreeze a Thane and after speaking to him, he tells us we must speak with arguably the most important character in this entire game. Game. Grandmother Raven. Grandmother Raven is said to have existed even before the spiral. She apparently gave the eyes of time to Bartleby at the heart of the spiral. We go and speak with Grandmother Raven and it's clear that the coven has trapped her as well. She tells us that she's been watching over us throughout the entire spiral and that perhaps we felt her presence before. She goes on to explain that even she knows the coven are especially untrustworthy and that they were able to catch her off guard and trap her in the cage. After consulting three wise sisters known as the Norns, we're able to gather the items we need to free Grandmother Raven from her cage. I just want to take a quick intermission to seriously say thank you to Dale Otterich and rest in peace. Her voice is genuinely a voice of absolute comfort for me. Every time I hear that voice, it is genuinely the most nostalgic and beautiful thing ever. Her voice almost feels like a warm hug from like a caring family member. And I'm just glad that she was a part of this game truthfully. So from the bottom of my heart, Thank you again, Doe Aldrich, and rest in peace. You truly blessed this game with your presence. You were a big part of thousands upon thousands of people's childhoods and are a core memory for a lot of us. Anyway, so back to the story. After freeing Grandma the Raven, she informs us that the legendary Ice Titan has four sons, Ostri, Vestri, Sudri, and Norjuri. Each son rules a piece of land near Hrundlfjord, and they have been friendly so far to the bears, the wolves, and the ravens. Surprisingly, the one that they actually dislike the most is their father, the Ice Titan. According to Grandma the Raven, while he sleeps, the four sons run wild. The four ice giants each have a means to bind their father to sleep. Four golden seals, one for each son. Our objective now is to retrieve all four golden seals. The gate to Australand opens to us first. The son Austri is our first target. We speak to him and he says that he will give us his golden seal if we pass four tests. We must demonstrate our superiority in strategy, wits, charm, and strength. We first had to defeat an individual named Skegis Forkbeak in a game called Thane's Table, which I guess is basically chess. We don't know how to play it though, so we need to consult someone named Amir Winterbane who will teach us how to play. Of course, for some reason, he's a really hard boss fight and he's angry, so after defeating him and fetching him some food, he teaches us how to play the game. We then collect some game pieces by defeating more frost bones and can now challenge Skegis to Thane's Table. Obviously, we win because we're just built like that and we have now passed the test of strategy. The next test is a test of wits. We need to defeat Austria riddle master in a game of wits this takes literally like 20 seconds we just tell him our name and we just insta win i guess next is the test of charm we must convince a warrior to part ways with his weapon the wolves have been causing austria a heap of trouble mostly their chief garm moonstalker he's our target after speaking to him he tells us that he's willing to give up his spear if his enemies are defeated so after tackling a few boars he hands us his spear and we have now passed the test of charm the final test is a test of strength we must defeat austria's mightiest warrior Solkir, who resides in the cave near by. We defeat him in combat and because of this, Austria keeps to his agreement and gives us his golden seal, but warns us that the other three seals from the other sons of the Ice Titan won't be as easy to obtain. After a series of long boss fights and speaking with Grandmother Raven once again, we obtain the key to Vesterlin in order to go after the second golden seal. We head inside Vesterlin and speak with Henrik Graincutter. A little bit of foreshadowing, but he quickly mentions how Grandmother Raven, in his words, sometimes has schemes within schemes, whatever that means, but a little interesting though. He says he will help us get into Vestry's hall if we help aid his people. So we defeat some winter claw stalkers that keep raiding their food supply and gather an axe that will allow us to chop down some trees and rebuild their palisade walls. After this, he keeps his promise and helps us get into Vestry's hall and we can now speak with Vestry himself. Vestry is willing to give us his golden and seal with no issue as long as we have a blessing from the raven next to him, Striker Scofflaw, who of course is a traitor and is also part of the coven and wants to bring about the Everwinter as well. He obviously disagrees with Vestry about just handing us a golden seal, so we have to beat him in combat. Once defeated, Vestry makes a funny remark about how he can't believe Striker's treachery and he'll have to have a word with his hiring manager. Anyway, so after giving us a golden seal, he informs us that the key to Sudderland is held by an individual named Freda Warsong. Of course, she won't give us the key until three warriors that died in combat some time ago that now currently haunt three caves nearby are defeated. So after another series of let's be honest unnecessary boss fights, we obtain the key to Sudderland and head back to Trundlefjord to check in with Grandmother Raven. Before heading to Sudderland, she warns us that Sudri is more malicious than his brothers Austrian and Vestry. To be honest, Vestry was pretty damn nice. Anyways, two out of the four golden seals are collected and it's now down to the second half. So we get to Sudderland and we need to first talk to Sudri's henchman Kettle Blackheart as he was sent to block and guard the path against meddlers. He goes on to explain that without a shovel it's impossible to clear the path ahead and that the snow in the area has been purposely piled in a specific 
specific way so that it will cause an avalanche if it's meddled with. And Kettle is the only one who knows how to clear it correctly. We smack him down in his cave and speak to him again outside afterwards. He reveals that Sudri placed Kettle there as a means of hindering us, perhaps to see if we're worthy enough to earn his golden seal. Two individuals named Herrick the Lean and Ormond the Surly hold the pick and the shovel. If we take them out, we'll obtain the pick and shovel and can then move on to hopefully speak with Sudri. Bingus Bane Bapis number one and Bingus Bane Bapis number two. All right, there we go. After collecting this pick and shovel, we can clear the snow off the path and move forward to speak with Thyra Bright Spell. She explains that Sudri's dragon gate is set up in a way that it will snap shut on anyone who attempts to pass through it that isn't a raven. So after gathering some raven feathers and some hemlock leaves, Thyra is able to cast an illusion that will make us look like a raven and we can now speak with Sudri. Similar to Ostri, if we complete a few tasks for him, he will give us his golden seal no problem. First, he requests some golden apples from Vestralon. A warrior named Jorda is guarding this golden apple tree, so we gotta blast her into the next millennium and take these golden apples back to Sudri. Sudri can kind of sense that we really don't trust him, so before doing the next task, he wants us to trap his words in an urn and weigh them on a merchant scale in Hrondo Fjord. Basically like that term, your words don't hold any weight, but Sudri is literally trying to show that his words hold weight. After doing this, Sudri can sense that we actually trust him now, and he says, you know what? You can have the seal. Go ahead and use it to save your world. We check in with Grandmother Raven once more, and we now have three out of the four golden seals. It is time to go confront Nordry to try to get the last golden seal. Grandmother Raven warns us about a troll named Stengar Wordwise, who guards Nordry's gate. According to her, he apparently loves riddles. We head there to confront him, and of course, he gives us a riddle to solve. If we solve it, he'll let us through the gate to see Nordry. His first riddle is, I go around in circles, but always straight ahead. Never complain no matter where I'm led. When am I? It's a wheelbarrow. All right, second riddle is this. Weight in my belly, a tree on my back, nails in my ribs, feet do I lack. For some reason, I actually didn't get this one right away, but Grandmother Raven kind of bails us out. It's a ship, guys. It's a ship. Anyway, so after solving these riddles, we get past the gate and speak with Nordri. He says he'll make a trade for his golden seal. There's a worm that resides in a cave under Grandmother Raven's tree that constantly gnaws at the roots of her tree. He says if we can bring him one of the worm's teeth, he will gladly trade his golden seal for it. However, unfortunately, the worm you know, won't just like give us his tooth for free. We need to make it bite off more than it can chew. We speak to the Norns again and they explain that if we gather some wild hemlock from Australia and some iceberg from a winter branch in Vesterlin, Reagan Wildleaf can use these items to brew a potion that will give the worm something to chew on. After doing this, we take the potion inside the cave and smear a little of the salve on the root and wait for Nethog to chew on it. Of course, the worm gnaws a little too hard, causing his tooth to fall out, allowing us to make the trade with Nordry and obtaining his golden seal. We now have all four. We return to Grandmother Raven and she says that since we have all four seals now, it's time to enter the door at the base of her tree to Nastron. We need to head to the curtain resting place of the Ice Titan and place the four seals down, ensuring that he will remain asleep. The caverns below are called Nastron, the bones of the earth. According to Grandmother Raven, it's a cold and desolate place. Our objective is to place the four golden seals before the Ice Titan. This will keep him in endless slumber. Once inside, we speak to a warrior named Doolin Helmsplitter. According to Doolin, Veneer Stormward, the Thane of Frundle Fjord, then Doolin and his warband into the caverns of Nastron to capture the coven after they attacked Frundle Fjord. Unfortunately, though, they were quickly ambushed and split up. Because of this, the warriors are scattered throughout all of Nastron. There's a final barrier protecting the Hall of Jotun Guard where the Ice Titan sleeps. To get inside, we will need a set of rune carving tools. Unfortunately, Doolin lost his down here somewhere. Not only that, he also had the images of four runes needed to open the gate. Those runes were with his carving tools as well. The winter skulls that surround the caverns took everything, meaning that we need to take as many out as necessary. After doing this, we discover that one of the runes we need to open the gate to Jotengard is in the hands of one of the worst in the coven, a skeletal warrior named Kulgrin Soul Sunder. Not only that, Kulgrin took one of Doolin's allies captive as well. After collecting Doolin's hammer, we break the ice wall and confront Kulgrin Soul Sunder. We're able to best him in combat and retrieve the second of the runes that we need, as well as rescue Truda Stoutheart. We speak with her and she tells us that the icy roof between this area and the next is very loose, so we need to use Hawk Horncaller's horn to cause the ice to fall, creating a bridge to the next area of Nastron. However, she also tells us to beware of the troll named Thelic Coldclaw, as he may be waiting on the other side. We blow the horn which causes the bridge to form and cross to the other side, but just like Truda said, Thelic is waiting for us ready to go on the other side. After clearing him out of the way, we speak with Hawk Horncaller, who heard his horn being played in the distance by us. He explains that he is now defenseless because the Frost Trolls took his sword and shield, so we quickly go and take him down to retrieve his stolen belongings. Now the next area of Nastron is blocked off by roots, however unfortunately we can't just cut them down because the roots are connected to the tree above. 
and they run throughout all of Nastron, meaning that if we cut them down, the caverns would all collapse, killing everyone inside. So we need to find a way to charm them. A warrior named Thorvin Tree Tamer has a magic flute lying around somewhere that when played would charm the plants and trees in the surrounding area. Thorfinn was in fact with the rest of the warriors when the coven attacked initially, meaning his flute should be nearby. The flute of course is just lying literally right next to the branches, wow. Anyway, so we play the flute and head into the next room. We are at the penultimate stage of Winter Tusk, as beyond this room lies where the Ice Titan sleeps. And this is the room where the rune stones need to be carved correctly. Unfortunately, the rest of Duelin's band is here, and they have all been possessed by the coven's magic to guard the next room of Jotengard. So now we need to defeat them in battle in order to proceed. After a long and brutal fight, they are defeated. And as a result, Duelin's band is freed from the coven's control. Now in order to get into Jotengard, we need to carve the Ice Titan's name onto the rune stones. After carving the Ice Titan's name into the four correct stones, we can now access Jotengard, the resting place of the Ice Titan. The Ice Titan's name being Demir. Once inside, we see a few familiar faces. Cole Shadow Song sits atop the throne in the room and boasts once again that the Everwinter is coming. But this time, it's a little different. The Coven don't challenge us themselves, but instead, Cole Shadow Song calls upon the four sons of Ymir. Seemingly also under the control of the Coven, our only option is to defeat them. The fight proves to be the most difficult in Grozelheim so far, as the Sons of the Ice Titan are indeed powerful, but it isn't enough to stop us. We are able to emerge victorious. Cole Shadow Song yells in anger and admits that we have defeated the Coven, destroyed their power, and thwarted their plan. Cole, along with the rest of the Coven, then flee, never to be heard from again. We place the four seals in their respective positions, which will keep the Ice Titan in eternal sleep. We return to Grandmother Raven once again, and she screams our praises. She then tells us to return to Headmaster Ambrose to break the news, and him and the other professors are absolutely astounded by our efforts in Grizzleheim. To wrap everything up, he then comedically remarks that he'll speak with Mr. Lincoln about getting us some extra credit. And with that concludes the full story and lore of Grizzleheim and Winter Tusk. Hope you all enjoyed. So real quickly, I just want to say that I've been having a lot of trouble recording as I just moved into a new area out here in LA. In these past few weeks, I've had issues with my power and my internet was a little wonky at the start. So we had to call people to come fix both those problems back to back. And I kid you not, two of the times we called the electricity people, literally no one showed up, even though they said they'd be on their way. I, I just had to, I just have to mention that. With that being said, as of right now, I'm recording this on May 19th. Everything is running smoothly. So I will be getting Arc 2 out hopefully by this Saturday or exactly a week from now, Monday. But thank you all for being patient again i do apologize for the wait i decided to give grizzleheim winter tusk its own separate video because one it is a side world and i kind of don't want to have to take a detour in the middle of that video to talk about grizzleheim plus this allowed me to go really in depth into the story and truly understand all the tasks that we do and why we do them instead of just a general overview of the storyline because if you guys noticed i pretty much went quest by quest in this video let me know if you guys would rather i cover arc 2 in a more general sense or go super in depth with each world like i did with grizzleheim because i got no problem with doing either with that being said, again, thank you for watching. Thank you for being patient. Arc 2 is coming hopefully in the next 7 to 10 days. Go ahead and follow my other socials if you want. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.